Thank you, Molly. Uh, good afternoon. Some of you have been with me for. Come on. One last time. Thank you. Um, I want to share with you one tip, okay? For the future, if you see me before a presentation, please don't touch my confidence. I just had one person coming to me and giving me tips about how to speak, especially not to be too shy. So here I am with the challenge not to be too shy because my whole presentation today is actually dedicated to fear. I decided to speak about fear today. There are a lot of great stuff out there. I want to talk about fear. And here's my first question to you. Since you are so much about data, let's have a reality check today. If you can take a piece of paper and write down for yourself, what percentage of your employees wake up every morning with the hope and aspiration to transform today? <laughs> Please write down that number. How many of you have it over 50%? <laughs> How about your percentage of your CEOs who say, today, I'm going to go straight to the change management team and say to them, this day is all yours. What do you need me to do? <laughs> okay? So clearly, some of you are wondering, what did I eat for lunch? Because I'm absolutely delusional. <laughs> and uh, it's a tough one, guys. It's really tough topic. So I figured we've been in this business for so long, we've got to try something new. So I decided to initiate a change management program with very clear incentive for the participants to participate. And I threatened them with amputation and blindness. 85% <laughs> of them ignored me despite my threat, even though my threat was credible because my threat came straight from their doctor. And I'm talking to you about diabetes patients. 85% of them will not fulfill the, full pres the first prescription. They will not fulfill the first prescription, despite the fact that the threat is very clear. And we work with the American Diabetes Association for the last couple of years, as well as with some of the farmers serving this audience. And I'll speak a little bit about that because I think we're missing the whole point. Our programs are designed for the C-suite, not for the cubicle. Our programs are not designed for human beings who are afraid. I have a digital transformation that I'm working with right now with an overseas bank. They went all the way, shut down branches, shut down cashiers. We are going digital. It's apps, it's online, it's social, it's mobile. 9,000 bankers are begging their customers, please don't download the app, they're going to fire me. And no one ever thought about that. The great consulting firm that was there to design the digital strategy just ignored the human spirit altogether. For those of you who don't know us, we are one of those crazy people that actually keep on going into big change programs and being scratched in the process. I had a conversation with a client recently when I said to him, look, you knew what you're going into. You spoke to our clients. You knew this is tough work. You know it's a big challenge. What did you miss in that? And the client, without hesitation, shared with me, said, look, we're like the drunk people who go to rehab and hope deep down that you'll buy me another drink. Yeah, we know it. Rationally, we know it. We have all the analytics out there. We just don't want to do it. We are afraid. And in our process, by the way, we got the privilege of working with a whole host of clients, anyway, from government recalls to SEC investigations, to mergers and acquisitions, and to customer strategy, as well as digital transformation, as I mentioned right now. So wide variety of things. And I was trying to figure out, why is it that the most common sense strategies fail so badly when it comes to the uh, execution? When we asked through a study that we have commissioned with Harvard Business Review last year about customer centricity, which is very important because the essence of every organization is to create and retain customers. Without them, we have no business, right? The SAP implementation will be perfect, but if there are no customers, we've got no business. Digital transformation will be amazing. The new healthcare plan you're, you're launching will be all amazing. Without customers, we have no business, right? Are you in agreement? 
Is anyone work for a company that can make their numbers without customers? Because I want to join. That's a really cool company. I'd love to work for them. Didn't find it yet, but you know. So when we asked them what's important to you, these are the elements that they said are important. Clear, defined vision, and senior management is aligned with strategy. You can see the numbers. See what happened when we asked them, which one of them have you actually implemented? 33% of those with great, clear strategy have their employees empowered to actually do what the strategy is supposed to do. Because the strategy was designed for the boardroom. It wasn't designed for Susie from accounting, or Larry who works in our store, or Jane who works in our, in our, in our uh, branch. We don't think about these people. We cascade to them. We trickle down. We train the trainer them. 25 years they've done mistakes, and we hope to send them some kind of a web-based system that in 15 minutes they'll answer some questions so we can check and say 95% of them took the course. And you know what they are? They are afraid. Because we are spreading more fear out there among employees than ever before. Because none of them wakes up in the morning and says, I am so motivated to change today. I am so motivated to transform. That is really who I am. So I think it's time for us to take a step back and stop designing diagrams that goes very well with presentation to the board and start asking ourselves a very simple question. How do we mobilize thousands of people to want to do it? Because it's the only way they want to do that. So let's look at a couple of facts. Change for many years have been an event that we needed to go and conquer. We're implementing SAP. We're implementing a new expense management system. And that means that we had a five-step approach, and for those of you who are more religious, probably seven steps approach, depends on which religion you subscribe to, that tells you to create awareness, understanding, acceptance, and whatever it is, and we need to finish that change. One of our clients, when we counted the number of change programs that are launching in the next four years, it's 30, three, zero. Change is no longer an event. Change is their new lifestyle. Change is what we do every day in everything. That means we need to shift from a thinking of a sprint to a marathon. We need to ask ourselves, how do we train new muscles that can absorb that much change? Because you all know, what is the one emotion that change in, uh, in, in ignite in people? Anxiety. We're basically saying our employees right now are living in constant anxiety. You show me one biological body that can live like that. That's what we are. That's where we are right now. Change is perpetual. Change is happening regularly. Change is not a project. Change is what we do. Change is how we move. And that is a shift from an event to a new lifestyle. Let's see how we're going to handle that one. Because the reason why your employees do not get up in the morning and say, I want to change today, is the same reason why your CEO didn't show up at your, at your office or texted you today saying, where are you today, man? I was, I was looking for you. I want to do some change stuff. Organizations are designed to repel change by design. You are going directly against corporate strategy, especially if you're publicly, uh, um, publicly traded. Why? Very simple. Your CEO needs to report quarterly results. How is he going to get or she's going to get her quarterly results? By you repeating what you've done and create consistency. How can we create consistency by repeating what we've done yesterday and the day before and the day before? We are addicted to predictability. Predictability is about repetition. Predictability by design is not experimentation. Predictability by design is not trying something new. And I love that CEO who told me when we put together the customer-centric strategy for him, he said, Lior, I love the strategy, and I'm going to tell you exactly when I'm going to implement it. And I said, when is it? He said, when you will guarantee me that it will work. <laughs> yeah, he wanted the impossible. He wanted a strategy that is guaranteed to work. We often tell them that we guarantee that it will work. They want guarantee. They want predictability. By definition, the organization that's supposed to absorb, on average, 30 change programs in four years is designed to repel each and every one of them. 
and I'm sorry to tell you, but when you are working against a design problem, you're not going to have new communication skills that's going to make a big difference. They're just going to say no in different ways. Some of them are going to say it emotionally and cry, and some of them are just going to send you out of the room. But just different styles of saying no. I want to take you back to 2002. What was the most popular social network in 2002? Anyone? MySpace? Check your history lessons. The name was Orkut. Orkut was so phenomenally successful to the point that it almost crushed the servers of the company who initiated Orkut. And then the founder of Orkut, uh, the founder of the company came and said, shut it down. And that's when MySpace got their chance and became who it is. The question is, who's Orkut and why did they shut it, shut it down? Orkut was none other than an invention of an engineer called Orkut who worked at Google. Google invented the first social network. Google told their engineers, go and experiment. You got 10% to 15% of your time to experiment. He experimented, came up with a great idea. Sergey Brin said, shut it down. Almost crushed their servers of Google. I'm not talking to you about the startup. Their servers are pretty hefty. Shut it down. Why did Sergey Brin shut it down? Sergey Brin shut it down for the same exact reason that your CEOs do not show up in your rooms. Sergey Brin shut it down because he had a formula for success. And his formula for success was his best practices. And the formula for success for Google when they beat Yahoo, Lycos, Excite, Alta Vista, and all the other search engines was superior computer algorithm. Social networks are ranking results differently. What do they rank results based on? People, not algorithm. So by definition, this was a new experimentation. It was proving itself. And Sergey Brin said to shut it down. That's how Google are still trying to catch up to social networks. The founder, as brilliant as he is, as much as he gave people the time to experiment, ultimately defaulted to his best practices. That's organizations that are designed for predictability. And when you're designed for predictability, when you're designed for best practices, by definition, you're driving your strategy forward while looking at the rear mirrors. That's how we execute right now. We are afraid of change because we are afraid not to make our numbers, because we are addicted to predictability. And instead of evolving to next practices, we are repeating best practices. That's what we see in our clients. They said the big talk, when it shows up, it's the same old processes. And they repeat them because that's what they know. So fear number two I want to talk about is the fear of change from our best practices because they are like the blankie of my little kid. They won't let go the blankie because the blankie feels good. It's a rotten blankie. I wish I can actually put it in the laundry machine. It's disgusting. I will be probably stopped by some kind of a welfare ex executive saying, what do you do to your son? But he likes his blankie, and he won't let go. And I know that image is not going to leave your head right now, but your CEO is holding on to his blankie and his Mercedes, just to make sure. <laughs> this is a study that we have not released yet. We just completed it with Harvard Business Review around change initiatives. 422 companies reported to that study. 91% of them reported that their change programs are a failure. I tried to arrange a meeting with Professor Cutter. He won't take my calls. 91% <laughs> of the companies have reported failure in their change programs. The result is rescoping. Less budget or less scope, more time, which means the strategy we are trying to execute is not going to happen at the time that we promise it's going to happen. Which means if our consultants told us that we have a window of 18 months to execute on this strategy before the competition is going to come in, now we are three years in and it's not happening. That's the reality. What are the drivers? The report will be issued in September. If you would like a copy of the report, please reach out to one of the uh, strategy people that is in the boot or myself. But here's the fascinating thing. You would think that maybe the scope of the project was just not realistic. It happens to us all the time. Or the budget associated with the, bu with the project is not realistic. So we gave them. We gave them a whole bunch of options. And we said, 
What is it? What is it that is actually keeping you away from executing a well-planned change program? Well, you're going to have to wait until September in order to find the reasons. <laughs> Anybody wants the reasons now? Seriously, with that amount of excitement? <laughs> Where's Jerry? Jerry, do you want the results now? Yeah? Thanks. Here's the interesting thing. The interesting thing is that human factor is the number one issue. Time run out is 17%. Not understanding the, the reason is actually over 50%. Organizational politics, they admitted to it, 50%. Our crisis is on the people's side. Our crisis is in the human side. Our crisis is in fears. And we are not dealing with emotions because we were told it's business, it's not personal. Guess what? It is personal. Because when you're in the business of employee engagement, strategic or otherwise, if you're in the business of customer experience, it is personal. Because for those of you who remember that from the previous sessions I told you, you cannot pay someone to smile sincerely. They have to choose to do that. They either choose to do that in your organization or they choose to do that elsewhere. We are dealing with number one issue in change, which is people. We probably have never seen a bigger gap between the need to adapt to change so fast and people being more afraid. We've never seen a gap between the ability of an organization to execute a strategy and that. The other fascinating thing that I find in change programs and in change practitioners is that many of them report to HR where they should report to strategy. Because what is change if not executing a strategy? What is change if not actually developing and delivering on the strategy that the company decided to do? And when one employee at one region decides not to change, they're holding the strategy. When I worked at HP, I remember meeting with the sales manager for the Midwest, and he decided to exclude a new product from his mix of what he's offering to his clients. He made his number for the, for the quarter, but he said, I'm not, our Midwest doesn't need the new product. And I looked at him and said, it's not your choice. I'm not asking you. You cannot go and change the company's strategy because it's not comfortable for you to go sell new products. This is a company strategy. This is not a personal choice. But we have never been in a bigger gap between the need to change faster than ever and adapt to perpetual change and the fear that we are seeing with people. Now, there are two approaches to change today. You may fall in one of these two categories. The first one is what I call the psychologist approach. The psychologist approach can very easily be described as they're grieving, give them space. They're in denial, then they're in crisis. They just need to go through the motions. It's going to take some time, and you just need to give them the space to grieve. That's the typical chart. You've seen it a million times. And guess what? We don't have time for that. Then comes the executive approach. Well, I don't really care. We have step one, step two, step three, step four. I need to see a green, yellow, red scorecard that tells me where I am, and I don't care about how they feel. Take your feeling elsewhere. Stop whining. Didn't ask you. It's coming from the top. And then 9,000 bankers tell their customers at the trenches when the CEO is not around, please do me a favor and don't download the app. Let me give you one more example that I really appreciate. One of my clients decided to automate and digitize their whole service. And they gave thousands of employees iPads. And they integrated the different systems into the iPad so it works really well. They, only, they trained the employees on the new iPads. The only thing they didn't bother with is how do you feel about that? So guess what they felt? They piled up the iPads on the corner and continued to take things in paper. And then came that brilliant idea of saying, we're going to ding you. 
We're going to have a study. We're going to do a survey. And there are going to be four questions about the app. And if you are not using the app, we're going to ding you on your salary. The one thing I learned about change is the human mind is so creative when it comes to dodging change. We should have a whole session on how many ways can your employees be so creative in dodging change, right? Amazing. I mean, we should write a book just on all the things. What did they do? They're smart people. They took the iPad. They put the papers on top of them, which define the iPads as the most glorified, expensive clipboards in the world. <laughs> and then in, a, in a, an embarrassing process, turned to the customer and says, do you see the iPad, sir? Do you see the iPad? No. So you know I use the iPad, right? Do you see what they're doing to me now? I need to use iPads to write my papers. Isn't that embarrassing? Now, in this specific example, you know what they just did. They diminished completely all the value in modernizing the service drive. In that simple thing, in that one sentence to the customers, they devalued the whole company initiatives. Millions of dollars went down to the toilet because of that employee making a comment to the customer that showed embarrassment. And we had to go back and restructure the whole process and engage with the employees in order to actually get them to embrace this because this was not a top-down process. It was recognition of your fears, working with your fears, but also putting you on a journey to be able to get out of it. We cannot ignore emotions. We cannot ignore fears. And we need to start recognizing those and start talking about them. I talked about diabetes a little bit earlier. The reason why 85% of the patients are not taking the medicine is because they are struggling with an identity crisis. Cancer patients do not feel guilty because they associate the disease with genes and with things that are outside of their control. Diabetes patients feel blamed for their health style, for their eating habits. They feel guilty. And until you're going to overcome that identity crisis, they're not going to take any medicine. I would submit to your consideration that your employees are going through an identity crisis each time that that change happens. It's not just about the issue with the future. Most change programs are focusing on departure towards the future. What the employees that I'm working with are dealing with is the past. And they're saying, 20 years I was doing this, is that wrong? Where do I file the past? Where do I file the last 20 years? What do I do with them? The country, Sweden, decided to go cashless. You cannot anymore get cash in a bank or deposit cash. There is no cash in Sweden. There's no cash. It's a cashless country. You're in church on Sunday, you open your app, you make a donation. That's how it is. And there is a virtual uh, you know, basket, and you just click into it. Bankers are now going through a crisis, saying, who am I? I used to be the cashier. So what am I now? And what we fail to understand, that the fear is not just about getting embarrassed or feeling stupid of using a new tool that I've never done or trying a new process that I haven't tried or anything else like that. It's about who am I? What is my, who am I? What is my identity? And where do I file the past? The way we approach change doesn't look at it forward. We actually start backwards. We start with the origin. We start by actually connecting to who you are and helping them rebuild their identity. Does that make sense? Are you with me here? The biggest insights I need you to understand, change is not only emotional. Change starts with where do I file the past? How do I redefine myself in the context of that? And here is the biggest insight I will leave with you. In our workshops, we're doing what we call the big split. The big split is when we split the core cause of who you are and what you stand for from the tools that you're using. The core cause allows employees to see how they don't change. It's just the tools. So if I will speak to a diabetes patient, I will say to them, not only you're not a diabetes patient, let me tell you who you are. You're a loving mother. And you have three children who depends on you. Until now, you treat them with the best way you can, but in order for you to continue to be that loving mother and be there at their wedding, 
you need to take this insulin. The insulin is your tool to continue and be a loving mother. To the bankers we said, you are financial advisors who help people fulfill their dreams. That never changed. Before, you used different tools like cash. Today, you'll use digital. But the core cause doesn't change. And when you do the big split, there's a huge aha. Because at that point, they recognize that there is consistency and continuity, and it's not a departure toward a better future. It is a continuity of who I, who I am. And I can then file the past and say, that's what I did then to leave my cause, and this is what I'm going to do now to leave my cause. Does that make sense, or oh, I'm completely at this point? Yes? 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 yes. Good. Change for many people is an obstacle. It's an enemy. When in a world of perpetual change, we need to change the narrative in their head. Change is not a big rock that we need to conquer with the expectation that after we do that, we'll go back to very calm waters. You know, just do the training on the SAP, and after that, it will be great. You know, just, just do that new, new, new expense management system, and after, oh, it's going to be good. No, it's not. <laughs> right after that, there is another one, and then another one, and then another one. So change is really water. Changes keep on flowing. And we need to change that narrative and expectation in their head. Because when we come in and we say, we are the change champions for this project, you know what they're saying in their cynical voice? Yeah, welcome to that one. I just finished with the other change champions for the other project and the other project and the other project. And we are trying to sum up something that the only way to sum up is to say it's not going to end. Let's start playing for a, sprint, for a marathon, not for a sprint. This is water. And the moment water stops, they die. This is water, this is not a rock. What we do with employees is transform the way they think. And we start with stop being a victim. Nobody's doing it to you. These are the realities. And we walk them through a process that starts with facing the realities, engaging with the emotions, redefining their role, not from the tool, but from the core cause, allowing them safe space to grow into the new skill set, not in front of customers, but in safe place, and then redefining and building an experiment-only mentality that will continue to try new things. You want your employees to come to you with an exchange. You don't want to be there for the next change. So you need to build the skill set for that. And that's exactly where our workshops are focusing on is putting them in the CEO seat and saying, stop the nonsense. You're the CEO now, what would you do? If you ever taught teachers, it's the most phenomenal experience. Because when you talk to teachers, they'll tell you, oh, the students are not listening to me, they all chit-chat with each other, and they're on their cell phones. Then put teachers as students, they do exactly the same. <laughs> I'm like, what, what's wrong with you? You're, just do you're doing exactly what you just told me you hate about how your students behave. It's the victim mentality. It's taking it passive. It's acting like you are doing something to them. And the first step, face it, is I'm not doing to you anything. You do to yourself. So let me take the study. Let me take the stats. Let me have you face it. And I want to hear what your conclusions is going to be. I'm not going to do anything to you. We did not make any decision. You're going to make the decision right now. And we structure in the workshop a process in which they make those decisions. Then we don't deny them their emotions, but we put a context for that. There are two elements that are important to us. We are not going to ignore your emotions, but we're also not going to ignore your readiness. So let's find out where you are. Are you totally stuck? Are you helpless, as in I don't know why, but I know how? Are you hopeless, that is I know why, but I don't know how? Where are you stuck? And we, by the way, work with managers to map their employees according to that and then work with each one of them according to the areas that they struggle. But let's talk about hope for a second, because that is your next challenge. The next challenge in change programs is pride. Write to yourself another number, which is what percentage of your employees wake up in the morning saying, I'm proud to work here. I'm proud to work here. It's a big word. Hopefully you'll agree with that strategic engagement. If they are not proud, 
We've got nothing. They will be reluctantly dragged against their will, and they will make snide comments to customers. What is the narrative? And that's again where you need to go backwards to the origin of the organization. What do we stand for? Who do we impact? Who, what is the human impact that we create? And then work the change as a tool, not as the core. But this has to come from that narrative. The narrative has to be human. The narrative has to be about people. The narrative has to be about how I make a difference. Because pride employees will kill it for you. And employees who are not proud, you'll drag them against their will and they will reluctantly comply. But they will drop it as soon as they can. So in the narrative of redefine, we need to connect them to the human impact that they make, not the tools that they use. And the moment they start doing that and raise their eyes above the computer and actually look at a human being that says, I need you right now, everything changes. That's where the narrative and the core cause has to take place. The next step in the process is helping them understand how good looks like and get confident with that. Not just knowledgeable, confident. If some of you are planning to go to see a show tonight, I'm sure you didn't get tickets to Hamilton, so we are not even going to go there, <laughs> but you want to go to see a show. You're expecting those actors to know their lines, you expect them to know their moves. You expect them to live by the character that they are going to perform. Are your employees ready for that? Are they confident? And when we operationalize it, it's all about identifying what's holding them back. How can we build safe space for them off stage to start building the confidence? Because we need to not only build the pride, but also build the confidence. I'm going back again to the very basic level. I don't care about your CEO right now. It's all about the employees. Because you are the sum total of their decisions. And if they're not confident, they'll default to old behaviors. Because of time, I'm going to run it a little bit quickly. But here's an interesting thing for you. A Couple of years ago, SAP hired me to go and do a very interesting analysis about the financial impact that SAP makes on customers. As you know, how many of you have SAP in your organization? We're not going to go into what SAP stands for. I'm sure you've heard all of those. And I decided not to go to the IT people. I decided to go to the CFOs. And this is how the conversation took place. I, I flew all over. I probably interviewed about four to 500 CFOs worldwide. Sir, did you receive an ROI analysis for this? Yes, I did. Do you approve the budget? Yes, I did. Is the project completed? Yes, it is. What percentage of the budget have you applied, of the ROI, have you applied to next year's budget? Want to guess? Zero. Zero. That means the whole change, the whole hassle of SAP in their mind is not about money. They didn't believe the numbers. When we build transformations, at the end of the day, this is greed. I'm greedy. I'm just greedy through love and customer engagement as opposed to greedy through efficiency. I'm here to make money. Make no mistakes. But make sure your change management is very clear about how much is it worth not doing that. Because in the mind of the employees, best practices will trump next practices every day. Because they don't know what they have to lose. Next thing is what does the future look like? I can tell you in customer experience, you ask employees to deliver great customer experience, it means different things to different people. For some of them, it's all about personal engagement. For others, it's about rushing it, rushing it, rushing it, and making it as fast as possible. Make sure they understand what the destination looks like. How can I perform to something I've never seen? How can I perform to something I don't know how it looks like? Make sure they see the, the beauty of the future, and therefore you become accelerators of that beauty, not people that drag them through a whole steps that they don't want to take. Develop the expertise. As I said, they need to be confident about what you ask them to do without being embarrassed in front of customers. Oftentimes, we give them those web-based tools, and they go to the customers, and they need to experiment on their own. And the first question that the customer asks, they don't know the answer, because they have not role-played it properly. And then they're embarrassed, and they're afraid of that. Build that confidence. Build that ability, what I call change resilience in the organization, to absorb change without the anxiety, but with the love. If there's one thing you can start doing, 
is connect yourself back to the strategy. You are not a separate division, a separate department. Without change, strategy is not being implemented. That means your organization continue to implement what they've done yesterday. This is about strategy execution. And we fail to see that because oftentimes we define change as a separate pillar in the different things that we do in the organization. It's not. It's the way to execute a strategy. And that's the part that your CEO is oftentimes neglecting. Measure what matters. We have so many measurements, nobody knows. And, and, and then they can hide behind whatever their measurements. And we don't measure the things that actually ma matter to the customer or the things that actually matter to this program. Make sure that it's tied back to that. Denial. Denial is a wonderful river in Egypt. It has no room in your organization. And we often don't like to deal with deniers because we are all one big family. We have a culture to keep. And those people exploit the culture every day and keep on delaying our programs. So denial needs to be on the table. And denial needs to be discussed. And denial needs to be escalated to the CEO. Because without handling denial, people will keep you back to past practices and away from next practices. And we don't like to do that. Oftentimes, we as outsiders get a chance to put a mirror in front of the deniers because we have nothing else to gain. We're not trying to promote ourselves or, or trying to maintain a status quo. There's only one person that can lead it, and it's not you. You provide the tools, you provide the, the guidelines, you provide some energy, but when your CEO is not there, the rest is not going to work. I did a big transformation, privatization with the Royal Mail in, in England, sat down with the CEO and I said, we've got a problem, we've got 160,000 male people and they refused to change. And you, we need to go to your boss. And she gave me a look. She said, do you understand what you just said? I said, I think so. She said, do you, see, do you know the org chart? I said, I, I, I think so. She said, do you know who my boss is? I said, David Cameron, the Prime Minister of England? She said, yes. And you just implied that you're going to go speak to David Cameron about dealing with the posties. I said, do you have a better CEO? That's your CEO. And this was the first time that I saw a prime minister getting engaged in a change management. What do you have to lose? Push it as high as you can because that's what they pay attention to. Your words, the CEO words, totally different words. Because the importance that they will assign to what the CEO says are completely different than yours. You can say the same thing. It will be heard completely different. This is about people. It's not about processes, because people operate processes. People operate technology. People operate digital. People come first. Your results come next. Go back to Zuzi from accounting. Engage with her. Make sure that she understands that it, has, it is her choice. You structure it correctly, and she will engage, and she'll run faster than you imagine. Drag her to predefined answers, and she will drag you back. Because the moment your workshop will end, that is when her commitment will end. And she'll go back to the old ways that she's doing things. One last thing before I finish is celebrate. Celebrate big, guys. You've got to shake up the organization to the belief that it can happen here. In our business, by the way, when you are in customer experience, everybody uses the same stories. Disney, Ritz-Carlton, Starbucks, Southwest. And the CEOs are saying, enough, I wasn't born that way. Can you teach me an engineering, 100 years old company to become customer centric? And I said, yes, we can. But you need to build that confidence that they are capable of that in the same way that Disney or Ritz-Carlton or others are doing. They don't believe it. Again, fear of losing face, fear of embarrassment. That's why your CEO is not there. There's a lot of fear in the whole process that we are dealing with. And if we are not going to start with the people, we're going to miss the whole thing. Last thing is, you've got to get used to the fact that execution will be different by different people. Because the moment you understand that you're the sum total of everybody's decisions, that means you need to allow them some space to do it their way. That means a personal signature needs to be there. If they all sign the same way, they are all basically autocrats who are executing to something else. When they bring their personal signature, then it changes. And that's part of our workshops where we challenge the employees, what will be your personal signature? Because we need it. Because without that signature, we cannot get this thing done. It empowers them but it challenges them 
to execute with that little touch of personal signature. The rest of the, hour, the, the, rest of the process is the same, but what is your personal signature? And in the own it, which is the last step in the five steps that I showed you, it's all about what is your personal signature? How are you going to bring your signature into the total process? If you want some more tools, you'll find some of our uh, studies uh, over there. The uh, book Driven to Delight became a Wall Street Journal uh, bestseller last uh, December. Actually uh, documents the whole process that we have taken Mercedes-Benz through. 25,000 employees, 360 independent dealers, 20 years at Lexus Control number one position. Within two years, we took number one position and we increased profitability. It can be done. No one has time for multi-year, multi-anything. They need results very quickly. If you want to learn a couple of things, this book will be available. I believe we have a couple of copies uh, over there. I'll leave you with one last thing. This is exactly what we tell employees. This is exactly the challenge we put in front of them. The future is happening, and it's happening now. You're sitting in the CEO seat. When they ask me, if I will adapt to that change, can you guarantee me that I will keep my job? You know what I tell them? Let me guarantee you what will not keep you your job. I will ag absolutely guarantee you that if you will not adapt to this change, you will get fired. That's the only guarantee I can give you. And that's part of treating them like the CEO. There are no guarantees. We are in a perpetual change where either we elevate our own value proposition and stay relevant or not, because that is the only question that's left. The future is happening. The only question is, are you going to define it or is it going to define you? Thank you very much. Have a wonderful evening.